Wow, I suppose we are almost live. I, are we live? I think we're live now. So welcome everybody to the first ever Impact Festival where we are showcasing some of Malia Sili's incredible partners. We are here today. Um, I am Rason Kantai Duff. I'm Wanjiko Kinuthia. And uh, Wanjiko heads up our partner communications work. Uh, I head up our amplifying work and our partner funding work. And it's really a pleasure to be doing this, to be spotlighting and showcasing some of Africa's most extraordinary um, conservation organizations. So we'd like to tell you a little bit about Malia Sili before we turn the spotlight to all of the partners as everybody now starts to join. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Some of you, I think, are, are joining us during uh, and as, as you are celebrating uh, the holy month of Ramadan, thank you so much for, for doing that. Thank you for our partners who are joining. It is maybe very early morning for you or, or afternoon or evening. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Uh, I'm very sure you will not be disappointed. You're going to be hearing a lot of our incredible partners work. So just to tell you a little bit about Malia Sili, we are an organization that supports um, local organizations across Africa and strengthens them um, in their work, um, catalyzes African conservation leaders, as well as helping to provide funding and influence opportunities to make sure that their profiles are elevated and they're able to, to have the impact on Africa's landscapes and wildlife and people's livelihoods, um, as you're going to hear. So um, all of this comes from a lot of rigorous partner selection. The people who you will hear from, you know, are really the best in terms of the governance work they're doing, building rights, building benefits for, for people as they secure these landscapes and, and, you know, bring lots of species back from the brink, working with forest ecosystems, so much that you're going to hear today. So um, Wanjiku, as we hear about this, we're not just hearing the stories, we're hearing about impacts. impacts. Yeah. yeah. And this is not going to be about our impact as Malia Sili. It's going to be about our partners' impact, many of whom are here today. And we have 12 partners um, who are going to speak about the work they do, the achievements they are making on the ground. But as Rasan said, our portfolio is bigger than this. We have about close to 50 partners across Africa. And one thing we were just chatting about before mm -hmm. Um, this impact festival started is that impact has become a buzzword in conservation, right, mm, Rasan? Yeah. What do you think? Like, we hear a lot about it, mm. but often we don't really know what it means or what it's trying to get to. Um, but what we really want to focus on today is really, really showcasing tangible results that our partners have achieved. Mm. Um, and many of them here have translated their, you know, lifelong passions into really, really great work that's you know, achieving all these great things. And so when we start um, this for the next 90 minutes, actually, mm -hmm. uh, it's great to bear in mind that this is all, you know, the partners who are here who are achieving this and will continue to achieve. But before we get into hearing directly from them, um, we have an amazing video we would love for you to watch um, to give you a bit of context about who they are and where they work and what this festival is really all about. So um, yes, please do play the video.
Hi, my name is Pain Marco. I work with Ujama Community Resource Team as the director. We ensure communities are able to manage, govern, but ultimately benefit from land and natural resources. I'm Dr. Andrew Stein, coming to you from the northern edge of the Okavango Delta. I'm the executive director of the Claus Conservancy. My name is Nara Kanyange, a co-director of Convent, coming to you from Mombasa. Convent works with local communities and cities along the Indian Ocean to conserve marine life and to create strong, long-lasting livelihoods. Hello from Madagascar. My name is Jimira Zabchala. I am the president of Tsinkwa Association. Cette année, le GERP célèbre ses 30 ans d'existence. Le GERP concentre entièrement sur la protection des Lémuriens. Notre mission est d'augmenter la population des Lémuriens. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rahima Jaidi and I'm joining you from Tanzania. Uh, I am the executive director uh, for Jomita. Uh, this is a community forest conservation of Tanzania. Join you, Elizabeth Achenu, assistant administrator. Zaro Trust is a not-for-profit organization located in Zaro, Kenya. Our mission is to safeguard biodiversity and empower communities within the Zaro ecosystem. Greetings from the mountains of South Africa and Mickey McLeod from Environmental and Rural Solutions. Hi, my name is Tina and I'm the Executive Director of Fanambe. We collaborate with local communities to build resilience in order to conserve the protected areas in Madagascar. My name is Antonio Shibita as Executive Director of Akadiri Angola. Akadiri is, is a conservation and the community development organization. Hello, I am Mohamed Kamuna, the Chief Executive Officer for Community Wildlife Management Areas Consortium, CWMC. This is a national organization dedicated to community-owned wildlife management areas in Tanzania. Hello, my name is Mo Angel Subiza, and I'm the founder and executive director of Wildlife Conservation Action, and we are based right here in Zimbabwe. As an organization, our vision is for human wildlife coexistence to be local-led and community-driven for improved livelihoods and thriving wildlife populations. been watching keenly and and enjoying it as much as we have we are going to be using a lot of superlatives today we're going to try our best to tone them down and vary them but it is going to be very hard not to say how fantastic and inspiring and beautiful um this is i also want to say that you know if you know anything about maliasili and our partners you will know that we like to balance the strategic with the intimate and we're seeing that you are all here you've watched this this video and you have all introduced yourselves in a kind of 
very straight way. I'm Rason Maliasili, Nairobi, Kenya. And we'd now just like to see if you have some superlatives or just some, some reactions to the video. So please type in a one word of what you've thought as you've been introduced to some of our speakers for the day and the, and the landscapes that they work in. Let's see, let's see what some of your reactions might be as just before we start to introduce all these speakers. Okay, incredible. Thanks, Akshay. You're kicking us off with the <laughs> balance we've been using. We love using. Yes. Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, feeling excited. We are feeling mm. really excited too. Small organizations, big impact. Amazing. Interesting. Enlightening. Yeah. That's a new one. Mm -hmm. We're going to add that to our vocabulary for the <laughs> Spectacular. Oh. Honestly, it's so impressive the work that, that that all these partners are doing. And and I think something that we we've, we've heard um Fred Nelson, our CEO, said say many times is you know, sometimes the work that that is being done, the stories and the the, the kind of impact that, that you're going to be hearing about is kind of normal to some of the partners who you're going to be hearing it from. They, they, they wouldn't even think this is something amazing that they're about to share with you. Um, but we really want to spend some time seeing actually how amazing it is and what this impact really means. So we're going to kick you off today with one of Malia Sili's earliest partners, uh, the Ujama community research team, have a uh, resource team have been with Malia Sili for many, many years. Thank you, Pine, for being here. Pine Marco is, is the executive director of UCRT. And this organization is one of Africa's leading indigenous land rights organizations. And a major focus of UCRT is to help communities gain rights to their land and resources. And in fact, you have helped secure over 1.7 million hectares of land for, for and with communities. So Pine, I think just to kick us off, we'd like to know from you, what does this land tenure security mean for pastoral and hunter-gatherer communities in Northern Tanzania? Thank you, Reson and the entire Maliasili team for organizing this incredible, um, you know, moment to share our diverse stories. So I might start by giving a bit of a background of who I am and how I'm connected to the landscape we work in. So I come from one of our working landscape and more specifically Ngorongoro district, Loliondo division. Most of you might have heard of uh, this area. Uh, so during the colonial period, my ancestors agreed to move out of the Serengeti to Ngorongoro and Loliondo to make way for the Serengeti National Park. But in 2022, 1,500 square kilometers of the Loliondo grazing land was taken away in the name of conservation uh, and turned into a game reserve. In reality, it's a hunting block for the UAE royal family. 70,000 people lost access to grass uh, and other resources. People in Gorongoro are being moved out as well. And currently a discussion of over 15,500 square kilometers of community land is being proposed uh, for uh, to be turned into a game reserve. Until 2011, the Hadzabe community, one of our target communities, lost 90% of their land to different interests. So the landscape we work in is surrounded by the most iconic wildlife sceneries, such as the Serengeti National Park, Ngorongoro Conservation Area, Manyara, Tarangire, several wildlife management areas. So UCRT, came into existence to address the rate of land loss for our target communities. We particularly target to secure communally owned, managed and used lands. These lands are connected and serve movement of people, wildlife and livestock. We do this through securing government management, increasing benefits to strengthen livelihoods. To date, we have been able to support securing of over 3 million hectares of land through land use planning. And of it, 1.7 million hectares is titled and gazetted as either grazing lands or hunting and gathering for the Hadzabe and the Akia communities. 
These lands support over 400,000 people. Further, communities have been able to establish but also closely monitor grazing uh, patterns in grazing blocks. But at the same time, formal governing structures are established to work hand in hand with traditional um, structures. In terms of benefits, through carbon trade, communities to date have earned over 3 million US dollars, mainly going towards improving social services. Through community-based tourism to date, communities have earned over, over 700,000 US dollars, but also through women, uh, social enterprises and VCOBAs, they have access to over 300,000 US dollars controlled, managed and benefiting women. In total, apart from the key economic factor driving livelihood, which is livestock keeping or hunting and gathering for the uh, hunter gatherers communities, a total of over 4 million US dollars are earned by communities from sustainable ownership, management, and protection of land and natural resources. Over to you. Thank you so much Brian, for starting us off on, you know, you, you, you've, you've ended up talking about these economic impacts and this, this, this work, but you started off, you started us off on a very sobering note. And it's reminded us that the work that we are here to do is, it's, fundamental and foundational when we're looking at governance, when you're looking at the kind of work that UCRT is doing to secure these land rights at a time where there, there is a rollback of so much of that that is happening. It's, we are so glad that we are your, we are so glad to be partners of yours as you do this, this work. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you, Pine. And we are now going to move from Northern Tanzania to Botswana where we are also going to focus on an organization that puts people at the center of conservation and also collaborates with them to find innovative solutions and appro uh, approaches that promote human wildlife coexistence, specifically human and big carnivore coexistence. Um, welcome, Andrew. Um, thank you for joining us. Andrew is the executive director of CLAWS, this organization in Botswana. And Andrew, we, we were, Curious to find out, it's great that while CLAWS remains focused on lion conservation, you've shifted your approach over the years. Please tell us how working more broadly on rangeland health and livestock production has helped CLAWS promote the coexistence of people and lions and, and large carnivores in Botswana. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to share our story. Thank you, Mali Asili, and all of those that have joined us. In 2013, uh, frustrated subsistence farmers exterminated 50% of the local lion population uh, through poisoning and retaliation to livestock losses along the northern Akavengo. Of course, poison use is indiscriminate, so not only was it killing the targeted lions, but also endangered vultures and lots of other uh, scavengers in the system. When we found out about this, we answered the call. Uh, we took a compassionate approach to engage communities through technology and tradition. Uh, instead of trying to persecute, prosecute people for, for poison use, we realized that they must be desperate in order to use poison. Um, so that was the approach we wanted to take was uh, a compassionate one. On the technology side, we started fitting lions with satellite trackers uh, and asked farmers uh, to name those lions in their local language to create a connection between them and the individual animals. When collared lions approach cattle posts or villages, residents receive real-time alerts via cell phone to encourage farmers to take preventative actions. Things like bringing their cattle into protective enclosures, lighting fires, even using noisemakers like vuvuzelas to try to encourage the lions to move off. These messages were formatted in um, the preference of the farmer. So uh, either voice message or text uh, in the language that they preferred, either English or Setswana. Also, we looked at traditional practices. Uh, we realized that cent the central issue 
to this conflict was um, unattended cattle. Historically, herd boys uh, used to protect cattle uh, from predators and brought cattle into areas that had seasonal grazing. But that no longer happens because many of those herd boys are in school and many of the adults in the village see herding as a low status, status job. So we formed the first uh, communal herd in Botswana. Um, we formed an elected grazing committee uh, within one of our partner villages and hired and trained herders in planned grazing, uh, conflict mitigation, basic uh, veterinary care for cattle. And uh, farmers signed conservation agreements saying that they will not kill lions and they will uh, help in this effort to restore rangelands and reverse overgrazing effects like erosion, desertification, and so forth in the system. Um, the impacts that we've seen so far, first of all, we haven't had a single lion poisoned in the last five years, which is fantastic. Uh, we've signed up over 250 farmers uh, to receive alerts within our lion alert system. We've dispersed over 30,000 alerts and reduced conflict by 50% with those farmers that take preventative action when they receive those alerts. Within our communal herding program, now we have three herds of totaling uh, 600 cattle uh, across two villages. And we practically eliminated lion uh, conflict within those communal herds, not having any losses in the last several years. On top of this, farmers uh, received nearly double the payout for their wildlife friendly uh, produced uh, beef uh, in local markets. So we're selling the beef actually directly to area lodges uh, that are encouraging these farmers to take on these uh, wildlife friendly practices. So we're really excited and proud of the results that we've had so far. Thank you so much. Yeah, those are great, impressive numbers, Andrew, and fantastic results um, as a result of your approach. Um, many of you might not know, but in my son's first life, she was a lion conservationist. I was, indeed. And, uh, <laughs> Um, I'd just be curious to hear, what are your thoughts to Claus's approach and well, what they've been able to achieve? It's it's really, it's fascinating, like the, the some of the things that are so similar to the work that, that uh, I was involved in and have heard about uh, as well from various other lion conservation partners in, in Kenya and in East Africa. There's like a lot of similarities, you know, the idea of naming the lions um, local names and, and making people, you know, see that and feel that ownership. Um, but just hearing that you have the first communal herd, that is, it's so different, but it's so critical and so important, um, that this this kind of work and just seeing the benefits as, they, as they've grown. And not only that, but thank you, Andrew, for also just having all of these numbers of data that I'm sure has not been easy to collect to show the growing impact, the reducing um, lion conflict that's happening in, in the region. Like that's that's amazing. And please, if anybody else has comments, has questions, we'd really love to, to see them and hear them in the chat. So now we are gonna be moving over to East Africa, back to the coast uh, of Kenya. And we are going to be introducing the Coastal and Marine Resource Development Team, uh, represented here by Nyaga, who is a co-director. And they are also you know, gonna be talking quite a bit about their livelihood approach. Um, we're looking at, at moving into this very dramatically different landscape. We're now in seascapes. And Comrade works to help communities develop practices, uh, practical solutions to better manage the marine environment in coastal Kenya. So Nyaga, I'd like to know, how are you helping local communities to improve the management of marine resources? And how are the livelihoods of people being impacted by this work? Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. And um, to answer your question, um, our work is actually guided by three strategic goals that underpin our interventions and develop through a theory of change. Uh, through conservation, communities are able to benefit from their own resources and also diversify their livelihoods. We do this through a number of interventions. Um, recognizing that attitude change 
and poverty reduction are key to improve resource management. Um, currently, we are working with 56 villages around the Kenya southern coast to support community land collaborative marine management or co-management. Uh, so we help communities strengthen local beach management units of VMUs that collectively now cover 100,000 hectares or about 1,000 square kilometers of seascape. And within this area, we have managed to empower communities to protect their fishing grounds. And we have seen the reef or the fishery recover from about 18% 20% and within one year. And people are also benefiting. For example, Munje BMU octopus closure. Um, this is where octopus is allowed to grow for some time without fishing. And that's that's what you call the, the, the closure. And why octopus? For those not familiar with octopus, octopus is fast growing and short-lived. On average, 18 months, and females die shortly after laying eggs, making it a good candidate for quick returns. The closure is about 40 hectares or about 1% of Munja fishing grounds. Towards the end of the last year, actually, 2023, after four months of closure, about 600 kilograms of octopus was harvested in just three days. Um, and for only three hours per day, which is equivalent to about one full day of fishing. And through monitoring, we have observed a comeback of fishes that indicates good reef health. For example, trigger fishes. Concerning livelihoods, we are supporting a revolving credit fund with 814 members called Eco Credit. That is, get a loan as you can serve. Last year, I would like to share this story from one lady. Um, when she got the loan, um, you pay, you get one loan and then get another one pay. Um, she used the loan to buy food for home consumption started a food business in the village, bought a freezer for juices she makes and repaired a house. Thank you so much for listening. Like, yeah, I am so inspired. Um, I don't know between Wanjiku and I, I don't know which one of us likes to go to the coast more, but as as, as Kenyans, that's, that's like a, a major pastime. And I'd like to say something about Comrade as we hear all of these incredible statistics, which is that I think I was inspired by Comrade before I even knew that Comrade existed. Because in the past few years of visiting the coast, there's actually a difference. In when you go, when you visit these beaches, there's a dignity that people have now that their livelihoods are far more secure that I didn't see five years back. There is there are marine resources, if you like snorkeling or scuba diving, the, the kind of resources that you see down in the coast around Wasini and Samweni, this is all due to Comrade's work. So I, 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 have, I have experienced Comrade even before I knew Comrade existed. And now seeing that, you know, hearing this 600 kilograms of, of this octopus catch in three days, like having having done the closures, and, and for those of you who might not have heard about um, the article that was that uh, featured Comrade in Monga Bay, just you can just Google Monga Bay Comrade, you will find an article about this work and 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 you know just going deeper into how extensive and how important it has been for the livelihoods of people, but also for restoring the fisheries um, at the coast where we we both love visiting so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. And from Comrade's um, very impressive work. We now move across the Indian Ocean to the island nation of Madagascar. As wildlife enthusiasts, what's the first animal you think of when you think of Madagascar? I want to see in the chat if people <laughs> will type it. Let's see, let's, let's see. see. Okay. What, what animal do you think of? Lemurs. Yeah, lemurs. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. And today we have the privilege of having an organization that has been at the forefront of helping Madagascar bring back critically endangered lima species from the brink of extinction. 
And this organization known as Je, um, I actually saw today, I think that, um, and Jonah, who's the founder, can tell us, I think Je is celebrating 30 years of its existence, which is fantastic work. Um, so Jonna, as I've mentioned, is the leading um, primatologist in Madagascar, who also is the founder and the president of Jerp. And a fun fact that Rason and I just found out is that his work is so impressive that he has a picture on a postage stamp in Madagascar to honor his efforts. And so it's a hu huge privilege that I welcome um, Dr. Jonna to talk to us a bit about the work that they do as Jerp but also to let us know that given the tremendous threats to Madagascar's um, forests, which um, the endemic lemurs depend on for survival, how has JERP been able to reduce forest clearing and degraded in, degradation in places where you work? And how has involving communities really contributed to this success? Welcome, Dr. Jonah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I would like to express my deep appreciation on, on behalf of my team. I would like to thank Malia Sili for all of your support, for all of your concern. Well, uh, GERB is an association uh, based in Madagascar. We manage three protected area covering 5,000 hectares and uh, communities surrounding them. Uh, there are uh, 4,600 people living in the area. All of the free sites where uh, GERB are working used to be subject of heavy loggings and hunting of various animals. And those are the two main threats, the big threats. Marmiza and Manumbu are on the national road. Therefore, it was easy for the loggers to go. How has Jerb reduced then those threats? Like, as you said, the forest clearance and degradation and huntings in Marmiza and in Manumbu. From the beginning, we knew that this will be a long campaign, a difficult campaign, especially when people who have, uh, who live in those uh, area are extremely poor and conservation is always difficult when people get little access to food, little access to healthcare and little access to education. We also knew that if people are part of the problem, they must be, part of the solution. And uh, the first uh, two years we started in Marmiza, for instance, was really a nightmare. We have to gain the trust of the local community. And uh, by, by doing that, we help the community to have legal land rights. And that was the key. That was really key. And at the same time, we worked with uh, the local community in a spirit of collaboration, but not in a spirit of dependence. And that is really important. We built strong relationships with the local community. For instance, they do the patrolling of the forest. They work as a guide and the permanent presence also is a key. We provided, we have provided uh, various far training on uh, different uh, farming, for example, fish farming, honey farming, poultry farming, different kinds of farming, and that helped them to improve the yields for example, for the agricultures. We also built, uh, organized a, a platform of uh, gathering all of the different groups within the community. For example, the youth, the women, the elders, the king, and they decide what they want to do, but not gerb. So we just there to support them. And what are the impacts, the big impacts, the bold impacts? Well, the forest, we are able to reduce the loss of the forest by 90% in 
in five years in Marmiza protected areas. Second, we the red build the red billed lemurs population density uh, in, tripled from 2010 to uh, 2018 from 32 to 91 in kilometer square in Marmiza and in Manumbu, a fast Manumbu special reserve in southeast Madagascar, illegal login violation dropped by 400% from 6.42 acres cleared in 2023 compared to 111.2 acres cleared in 2022. Uh, there was also reduced um, improvement of the livelihood of the community and the bold impact is zero, zero for precious, no, which means no deforestation, no clearance, no hunting in Marmiza. And uh, that was used by the Malagasy government today as a good success for the whole country in Madagascar. And I would say if that works in Manum and Marmiza, why not to the rest of Madagascar? Thank you very much. <laughs> wow, that I mean, that is why you're on a postage stamp, stamp Dr. Journal, like that, just hearing all of those statistics, that is zero, zero deforestation, zero, I mean, I, yeah, wow. Yeah, no, just tremendous impact, Dr. Jonah. And thank, thank you for you. what you're doing, your approach um, so clearly, and also showing the results that you're achieving. We are thank going you. to scout now, um, but head northwards to Arun's forest, where another of our partners, Simka, is also helping to reduce uh, forest loss, which is contributing to um, Lima population growth. Welcome, Jimmy, from Tsimka. Very good to see you here. Um, Jimmy, our question for you is, based on the success of your agroforestry efforts, Tsimka is beginning to support other protected area managers in implementing similar projects. What should you say are the enabling conditions required for this to succeed in other places? Welcome, Jimmy. Sorry, Jimmy, you're on mute. Yes, sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to share our impact and approaches. As you know, like uh, in many countries in Africa and in the world, here in Madagascar, one of the main problems is that there is an overexploitation and destruction of natural resources leading to a loss of biodiversity and its ecological functions on which local communities depend. One of the causes of this destruction is the agriculture. Why? Because the majority of the population practices the activity as a source of food and the income. They clear the forest uh, or their ecosystems to get product and uh, a war of this of the situation and the bad impact it can generate. Simca, which is a local organization, applying an innovative approach in Madagascar for the rehabilitation of ecological functions, has intervened at one protected area. It is called Origin in the north of Madagascar, where a large part of the forest has gone because of this uh, uh, practice. Animals becomes very rare, and water sources are dried up. For that, uh, we have implemented activities for the management of the site. We have undertaken activities for the restoration of this dry forest, following a protocol developed by uh, ourselves. And also, we have supported farmers for the implementation of dynamic agroforestry, which is a very lucrative and productive agricultural approach but less uh, destructive. After that, what's happened? The loss of uh, the forest cover has been significantly reduced, even almost uh, stopped. And the body lemur, the population of lemur coronatis has increased, and uh, even it has doubled over the last 10 years. And uh, economically, 
especially about the life of the farmers. There was a clear increase uh, of their revenue with an average of uh, 50 US dollars of increase per person per month. And uh, about the soil and the ecosystem, qualitative data showed much higher water retention in the soils, enabling good production for the farmers and also enabling people around the site to, to have uh, the right. And uh, we had those impacts through the implementation of ecological restoration and dynamic agroforestry with the good monitoring to ensure the success of the action. And note that those approaches are tested and adapted on the local context of the site by ourselves. As our mission is the accelerate, accelerate restoration of ecological functions in Madagascar in order to improve livelihoods of the community. So to achieve our goal, we need to keep those conditions in the place we are going to scale up our intervention. That is practice of dynamic agroforestry, undertake adapted ecological restoration activities and implement a good monitoring strategy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jimmy. And it's great to see that you realize your model works and now you're scaling across the country mm -hmm. um, where it's desperately needed to reverse forest loss, but also um, help with endangered species mm -hmm. um, conservation and management. So kudos to you. Yeah, it's so nice to yeah. hear the two, you know, hearing Jerp, hearing of Simca, and, you know, it's it's working towards the same thing in very different and innovative ways. And it's 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 building off of these different approaches and they're both having such important impacts. And yeah, thank you so, so much, Jimmy, for that. So we are gonna stay- You're stay welcome. We're gonna keep talking about forests. And, and I, uh, I, I, I got a very interesting fact from Wanjiku uh, earlier today, which I can't believe I didn't know, which is that Tanzania, has the third largest forest cover in Africa. I, I can't believe I didn't know this. Like I'm very embarrassed. <laughs> Close to half of the country is covered in forest. It's, it's you know, of course, a lot of it is Miombo woodland. And this makes Tanzania's forest, Tanzania's forest vital, not just for East Africa, but for the whole continent, for, um, for the carbon sinks that they provide for the entire world. I, I, I am still very staggered by this. So, you know, we've just heard about these two forests, um, were groups that are working in forests, and we're going to hear from a third one now in Tanzania. And this is Ntandao wa Jamii wa Usimamizi wa Misitu Tanzania, which is Njumita. And Njumita is one of Africa's largest forest, uh, largest networks for community forest organizations. Um, Njumita has been helping communities to restore and to secure their rights for forest resources and identify ways to benefit from sustainable management practices. And we're joined today by the executive director, Rahima, uh, who is a dynamic and incredible individual. I want to know, Rahima, um, you have supported more than 2,400 customary land rights certificates as Njumita. What does that mean for communities and for their forests? Uh, thank you, Reso. Thank you, Wanjiku. And thank you, Malia Sili. Uh, for organizing this very interesting event. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, we know that, uh, I'll, I'll focus on women only, uh, because this is the group that we know has been marginalized uh, for a very long time when it comes to land rights. So when it comes to issuing the certificate of the customer certificate of land, land, of, land rights, it, it gives them more strength. Uh, it's like a, it's, it's a land security. They can use that certificate uh, for various reasons. For example, now we have cases where we support the communities. Um, they they can access uh, credits or soft loans uh, based uh, based on those uh, uh, certificates of land uh, land occupancy, and uh, it gives them power. Now women are empowered; they can take care of the families because they have this uh, confidence that they can uh, invest in their land. Investing in a sense that they can use the land. Uh, the certificate, the title deeds, I can say, to secure loans and invest in uh, in a more sustainable agricultural practices. That means they can yield more, uh, more, more, more products or more crops uh, compared to the to, to the other years. 
But again, they can use that uh, certificate to access loans from microfinances and start other kind of businesses that are more friendly to the environment. For example, we have cases where women are using the title deeds to get loans to, to establish small enterprises, uh, small businesses like uh, small kiosks, uh, like local food vendors. Um, so it's, 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 it's a number of, 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 of benefits that the communities are, are, are now experiencing because of the title deeds. And uh, one thing that is very interesting that uh, really caught even our attention is that um, the, in some cases, even the men are willing now to have their names, like the, I mean, the name of the wife and the name of the husband in the same title deed. And this is because they all understand that when when something comes into pass, um, we can hear you, Rahima. Keep going. Oh, yeah, I heard background. Yeah, so I was talking about a very interesting uh, scenario where the husbands are now willing to put both their names in the title deed, like his name and the wife's name, because they, they are aware that when situation comes to worse, maybe maybe the husband passes, the wife, he does not want the wife and the kids to be like chased out of the land. So this is a very positive outcome for us. And now uh, what do we, how do we link this in for, with forest management? When people have title deeds, they can, they're confident to invest in other businesses, small kiosks, food vendors, you know, so that, that, that they, they, they refrain from going in the forest to cut for timber or for illegal charcoal because they have other, uh, other avenue for revenue generation. So this is a, a point where we want to see that every village we have community communities who have access to the title deeds. So, and this is our goal. We want to move around and help communities, especially the women and the youth. Youth are, are coming up so much, like they are now awake that they want these title deeds so they can have businesses, they can use them for various uh, various um, in interventions. So there's a very good link between having the title deeds and, con and, and for controlling how the forest resources are being used. Thank you, over to you, Reso. Thank you so much, Rahima. You know you're making my heart sing. Just connecting forests to women, looking at these title deeds and how these livelihoods have changed and that has really reduced deforestation and you know allowing these forests that are such important um, carbon sinks for this continent and for, for the world to, to thrive. And at the same time, you're hearing, you know, women, men who are making sure that their wives are now on these title deeds, like there has been such erasure of women in many of our patriarchal societies. So I, I don't think when this started, I, th I thought that we were going to hear something so powerful about women during Women's History Month. Like this yes. is, it's, it's really, it's really, really powerful and, and inspiring. Thank you, Rahima. And thank you for the scale that this is, that you're doing this on, you know, having all of these different, different groups that you're working with. Um, great. Okay. I don't know how you're all feeling, but I am feeling, and I think we both are feeling really inspired, really charged and energized. Uh, I'm sure some of you would like a little bit of a break. So we're going to take a break, but as we're taking this break, we'd like you to, 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 to stick around because there's something special that's, that's going to be happening. So as you, as you maybe grab your tea or coffee, we have a very special song for you. It's a never heard before song. It was literally recorded for this very impact festival. So we are all very special and privileged to be hearing a song that is about conservation and about um, all of this work and all of this impact that you're hearing. And it is done by Feliciano Dos Santos, who is familiar to many of you. If you came to the African Community Conservation Forum last year in September, you would have met him, but you would have not heard this song because it literally was recorded just a few weeks ago. Feliciano is a Goldman Prize winner. He is a member of the ACLN, the African Conservation Leadership Network, and he's a member of um, Malias, one of Maliasili's Mozambican partners, Regecom. He's he he built, he is part of that that group that we also work with. So hold on to your hats. Maybe get up. I'm sure Wanjiko and I are gonna be dancing around the Maliasili office as this song <laughs> plays. So here we go. I 
África, 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 Unidos pela ação e amor, Unidos pela ação e amor, A conservação e é o caminho. A conservação e é o caminho. A natureza é preciosa, é nosso dever preservar. Os elefantes mais estudos ao leão que ruge sem terror. Cada criatura é preciosa, cada objeto é valioso. Que o amor pela natureza reine em nossos corações. Welcome back, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed the song, the really beautiful melody. Um, We're still dancing. Together. <laughs> Actually, Rasson is still dancing and she has some news for you. Oh my gosh, no. She has promised that she's going to collaborate with um, Feliciano and release the next song we will play at the next Impact Festival. So please do not miss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have to come to the next. If you all promise to come to the next Impact Festival, I promise I will I will find Feliciano and we will do this song. A collabo. Will, yes. <laughs> Conservation collabo. All right, back to the partners and back to Impact. Um, we are now taking you to a place that's not too far away from where Rason and I are right now, um, to the staggering Savo ecosystem in Kenya, which is home to plenty of high-value species, including... 40% of Kenya's elephants and 18% of our country's critically endangered black rhinos. Sabo Trust was founded about a decade ago um, with the aim of being the anchor organization for community conservation efforts in this really important ecosystem. Today we have Liz from Sabo Trust. Welcome, Liz. Um, our question for you is, we know that Savo Trust has played a vital role in protecting wildlife and biodiversity across the Savo ecosystem, one of Kenya's largest. And actually, Rasson, just let me know that it's the size of Belgium. Yes, size it's 4.2 million hectares, mm -hmm. which is massive. Um, but more recently, Savo Trust has now turned from um, just purely focusing on species and ecosystems to also looking at local communities and community conservation in the area. So Liz, please tell us why this approach and what has it helped you organization achieve? Haribu, welcome. Thank you, Wanjiko and Riso, together the Malia Sili team. So Tsavo Trust is an actively contributing to the global biodiversity framework targets, which aim for 30% of our country's landmass to be dedicated to conservation by 2030. In pursuit of this goal, Savo Trust has played a pivotal role in supporting the establishment and stewardship of two community conservancies within the Savo Conservation Area, which are Kamungi Conservancy, that is to the northern boundary of Savo West National Park, and Shirango Community Conservancy, which is to the southern boundary of Savo East National Park. 
Here in Savo, we are employing a holistic approach known as the integrated conservancy model, which ensures a mutual beneficial solution for both the local communities and wildlife conservation efforts. Through this approach, it has garnered widespread community support and engagement with over 5,500 individuals in Kamungi and Shirango Community Conservancy actively participating and taking ownership of the conservation efforts. Through actively involvement, the local communities are reaping various benefits from wildlife conservation initiatives. They are also consequently creating more space for wildlife conservation. Now, the key improvements in community livelihoods include, number one, access to clean and safe water, mitigation of human wildlife conflict through our tailored measures, enhancement of food security through our permaculture and climate smart agricultural practices, implementation of climate oriented climate-oriented activities, including training permaculture and climate-smart agriculture for over 200 households within the Kamungi and Shirango Co Community Conservancy. We have also provided energy-efficient cooking stoves and adoption of solar home solutions by the local communities. In fact, there is also infrastructure, infrastructural development such as schools and health centers, both within, the, within and surrounding the to conservancies. And in fact, additionally, there's implementation of revenue generating initiatives such as the establishment of ecotourism facility. Beyond this, there is employment opportunities within the community conservancy model. Overall, Savo Trust conservation efforts have yielded significant achievements. Number one, expansion of land under conservation. Number two, there is a remarkable 80% reduction in human wildlife conflict within the Kamungi Conservancy. Additionally, there is subsistence decline in trophy poaching with a reduction of over 70% in the last 10 years. And to add on to that, there is promotion of coexistence between the local communities and the wildlife, as well as establishment of these two com community conservancy has created a crucial conservation buffer to the protected areas. Through our concerted efforts at Savo Trust, we are making tangible strides towards fulfilling our conservation targets while fostering sustainable coexistence between communities and wildlife in the Savo landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And um, what great feedback to hear about the reduction in human wildlife conflict cases the reduction of trophy poaching, and also the benefits that the communities are um, getting from conservation. Mm -hmm. One thing that we forgot to mention is Savo is one of the few places in the world where you can see elephants that are so big and with tusks so massive that they almost touch the ground. Mm -hmm. And these are called tuskers. Yeah. So if you if you ever visit Kenya mm -hmm. and you have the tusker beer, that's that's, that's what where it comes. From. That's where it comes from. The great tuskers are the big tuskers that have a hundred pounds a side, and they are literally owned. Like I think that's I'd say seventy percent. Well, maybe Liz can tell Liz us. Can tell pounds us in in, in Yeah. So um, keeping them alive, keeping their landscapes connected, is connected to to people. Yeah. Now, before we we jump into the next partner, I just want to say that. Uh, in Malayasili, we're all about inclusion and we realize that people are probably feeling quite excluded at the moment because many of you have comments in the chat and where we as the hosts and panelists are seeing them because you are writing them directly to us as hosts and panelists. So please, if you've got a comment there, just check to see if, you're, if you've selected either hosts and panelists and make sure you copy and paste it and make it to everyone so that we so that everybody can see your, your comments so that we are we are inclusive. We, we make sure that everybody um, is, is enjoying and really um, benefiting from, from, from all that you're saying and all the questions. Um, there have been lots of questions, good comments. Please keep those coming. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. And, and thank you for, for, for inspiring us with that. Now we're going to go down south to South Africa. Um, and we are excited to introduce our first ever South African partner, um, this is the environmental and environment and rural solutions um, team, which is represented by the founder, 
um, Nikki, and ERS promotes landscape restoration for thriving rural livelihoods in an area spanning multiple provinces in South Africa. So Nikki, you have done this work, which I know we're, we're going to be blown away by, and you focused a lot of, on, on, of your work on supporting communities to develop conservation agreements. So what we'd really like to know is how have these agreements changed the way communities use this land and how has increasing the revenue generated by livestock, which uh, is a staggering 2.2 million over the past decade, how has that helped to restore land in the area? Thanks, Wanjiku, and greetings to everyone from the almost southern tip of the continent. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned that our funny little acronym ERA stands for Environmental and Rural Solutions, and that's kind of what we're about. We're very rural. Um, and just in answer to your question, we we try and build on the, the Great Conservation Agreement uh, framework that Andrew from CLAWS outlined. Um, but we're in a landscape that doesn't have the big iconic game. We don't have the tuskers and the lions and the other um, sometimes trouble causes that Andrew mentioned. Uh, but we do have very rich, montane, um, endemic biodiversity, which is under threat. We've got quite a few red data species in the mountains. Um, and importantly, these mountains also act as a strategic water source area, supporting more than 2 million people downstream. So our regenerative grazing approach goes kind of beyond cattle um, and the amazing 2.2 million that you mentioned, which if you turn that into job equivalent, it would employ 1,500 people as, as farmers at home, which reduces urban uh, urban uh, sorry urban migration from rural areas um and what we are learning is that you mentioned the word inclusivity just now you know south africa has a turbulent past um of excluding certain groups and people becoming very marginalized and not part of part of their own futures um but what we've done is we have we've listened and learned through our village based eco champs so these young people who are showing us that they can be the agents of change and basically they bring back and take out their their liaison um, ambassador in a way and we've learned so much from them which has allowed us to 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 take the conservation agreement framework to a much wider and deeper reach to other rangeland users rather than just large livestock owners you know the cattle guys who are often the elite um the word cattle barons is not there for nothing um, so we now have um, women who, who are much more included. They're the thatch collectors and, and largely the small stock owners. Um, you know, fleece is an important commodity. The youth, um, so many of the youth are migrating to urban areas because they don't see a future in rural areas. Um, and agriculture actually can become a viable career for many of them. And very importantly, we have a growing membership base of traditional healers who are the custodians of the medicinal plants in this area that has such rich endemic biodiversity. Um, interestingly, the other day we were vaccinating a bunch of small stock and the, the goats and the sheep are always mixed together. And I was saying to one of the eco champs, why are you not vaccinating the goats? And he said, but don't you know, the goats self-medicate, they eat joy. And so they deworm themselves. They don't need to be vaccinated and it saves people money, but they're now struggling to find the plant because of fires and over harvesting. You know, the, the eternal endangered species syndrome. Um, so this inclusivity approach of bringing people into those conservation agreements, which are renegotiated seasonally, has helped us to, to really start undoing that history of exclusion and to reach since, well, since we've been going since 2002 and, and ERS is not me, we're a team of 18 amazing people. I'm like the old furniture now, um, but we've been able to reach about 90,000 plus people um, with better livelihoods and, and 40,000 of those all have better, safer, reliable water at World Health Organization standards. So managing these rangelands in a regenerative, inclusive manner has got a whole bunch of other benefits beyond cash for cattle where people are, are, are seeing more water being regenerated through alien plant clearing. We've got a few charcoal businesses emerging for young people. Um, and we, we're seeing that that water can be protected. Um, it doesn't have to be mega million dollar schemes with pipes and taps and pumps, but for $12 per person, people can have water for life. So we're seeing these other impacts just through regenerative rangeland approaches, which are inclusive. And even though we have 30 rangeland associations who've signed season after season, the depth and the representativity is so much greater now from 
traditional healers and, and youth and other livestock owners. Okay. So, yeah, that's really our story. Um, we, we're not the big game guys, but we have a whole lot of other benefits. Um, yeah, and I think one of the big things we do is, is restore hope and self-esteem with rural communities. Um, so thanks for the opportunity. It's so inspiring to hear these other stories from you guys who do have the amazing animals in your landscapes. And um, we'd love you to come to the mountains sometimes and see what we have. We would love to come to the mountains, Nikki. We're going to take you up on that. That just just hearing about these connections, I I am blown away. Um, just from just from the agreements and food from these large large livestock owners, and you're looking at youth and women and traditional healers, and just that connection between the traditional healers and bringing back and restoring those 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 traditional um and medicinal plants that they need to carry on with their work. And then the youth not going, uh, not 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 leaving these areas and seeing that this is a viable place to live, it's it's profound. It's profound beyond, um, just beyond the 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 one thing that that has triggered all of this work. So thank you so much, Nikki, um, for sharing that. And yes, we 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 often say that we shouldn't always just have that focus on these large megafauna because. You know the, the this sort of work and the, the diversity of this work is what will stitch up our landscapes and is what is actually going to to bring the restoration that's needed and it's the diversity of approaches and innovation as well. Yeah. So you you have yeah. highlighted that in just three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, we are now going to be moving a little um, a, a little away from 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 the southern tip and we're we're going to go back to Madagascar. Um, and we are going to be introducing Panambi, and this is an organization that is also protecting forests and also using a different innovative approach from Jerp and from Simca. And they are using and working with one of the world's most valuable spices and, and something that I'm sure many of you either have in your kitchens or you have something that has it or you have had it in the last maybe one month which is vanilla. Panambi, whose name means embracing challenge in Malagasy, is one of the country's pioneering conservation organizations, working in 12 protected areas and helping resident communities generate income while protecting these areas. And we have Sandy joining us um, from Panambi. So Sandy, you focused most of your efforts on identifying and developing enterprises to inject capital into community conservation efforts. So over half a million dollars in revenue went to communities in just the last year. That is astounding. How does helping farmers earn more income from vanilla support forest conservation efforts? Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Rustin, um, for the question. Thank you for, for the introduction. Um, as you might already know, poverty usually drives deforestation. And in a vulnerable country like Madagascar, forest is the main source of livelihood for many people. And here, it's not just about collecting and harvesting food from the forest, it's more about clearing the forest to make place for farmlands. And at this rate, we have lost 80% of our forest covers over a century. But Madagascar is also a very favorable land for cash crops. And just like you said earlier, Madagascar is the largest uh, uh, exporter of vanilla in the world, and vanilla is the most expensive spice after saffron. The problem is most of the smallholder farmers still live in poverty, continuing the cycle of forest burning and clearing to provide for their families. And this is where Fanambi intervenes. Our work is to collaborate with local communities to build resilience and preserve biodiversity. In the case that I mentioned earlier, we partnered with Missouri Bot Botanical Garden, which is also another protect the, uh, man protected area manager. And we found a way to increase the farmer's revenue by building a resilient supply chain, linking large buyers with local communities and federating them into a social enterprise that we call Tambacha. And in 2023, we generated more than half a million dollars of revenue for the communities. We supported and trained 3,000 farmers 
all of which have seen a significant improvement in their quality of life. As a result, they are more prosperous and resilient. The high income made from the vanilla production offered them an alternative to forced clearing. Today, there is no longer deforestation in the protected area that Missouri Botanical Garden is managing. But this is to say that increasing farmers' revenue is only one of the pillars uh, that contribute to lowering the need for deforestation. And it really improves the conservation effort. But this is not the only place we are developing alternative livelihoods through social entrepreneurship. In fact, we take this approach to all of the protected areas we manage through tourism, rice production, fishing, and vegetable crops, all to build local community resilience. Today, we can no longer exclude local communities out of conservation. They have a part to make and responsibilities to take alongside the authorities, the government, and the protected area manager. But they cannot fully take ownership of that protection unless they are resilient themselves. And until they are ready, Fanambi will be there with them. Thank you, and over to you, Reza. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Sandy. This is, it's it's so exciting to hear that you start with vanilla, but then you're, you're talking about all of these other things that you're doing with other, with, with all of these communities around, from the vegetable farming, the fishing, the tourism, um, so many different approaches, but, you know, just zeroing in on, on the vanilla. I am very glad that every time I have, I will have my vanilla ice cream or sip my vanilla tea latte at some point. Um, we will remember that this is that that your work is contributing to this um, bringing back yeah. these that, that deforestation is is at an all time low in so many of these areas. So, yeah, this is it's exciting and it kind of brings it closer to home. Oh, Thank yeah. you. And I love the quote that you that you said right at the end that today we can no longer exclude local communities from mm -hmm. conservation. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a great summary of the conversation we are mm -hmm. having today. It um, is. It is. And I, I'm just seeing that there's a there's a, a comment. Yeah. Um, expert local and small organizations with tech contextualized approaches that deliver real conservation impact that is inclusive with those that are living but we're living there long before conservation was mainstreamed. Love it. Thank you, Pedro. And thank you for really highlighting the concept of decolonizing conservation, which if you get me talking about it, I will talk for a long time, but I think each of these speakers are doing this very thing. Yeah. Could not agree mm -hmm. more. Um, away from Madagascar now and back to East Africa, back to Tanzania. Um, we are going to now spotlight an organization that is helping to scale community-led wildlife management conservation across the country. Um, this is known as the Community Wildlife Man Management Areas Consortium, which is a network organization that supports the growth and development of Tanzania's community wildlife management areas, more popularly known as WMAs. And these are often community designated and managed areas. Um, we are joined today by Kamuna, who's the CEO of CWMAC, who is going to shed light on some of the work they're doing and how it's helping to catalyze community-led wildlife conservation in Tanzania. So Kamuna, 7% of Tanzania is under community conservation already and that's WMAs. This number for a country that's absolutely vital as we've been speaking to, to not only East Africa, but Africa and the, and the world, is very impressive. But what does it really mean in practice? Um, thank you so much, Rison and Wanjiku. And uh, generally, thank you so much, Malia Sili team, for organizing this uh, unique and first ever uh, festival. So uh, for us, CWC, uh, having 7% uh, of Tanzanian mainland uh, being managed by a local community is something uh, which we take 
not for granted. This is because, um, first of all, the location of this um, piece of land, they locate uh, around or in the very critical area of our uh, beautiful and important ecosystems. So it means now uh, these wildlife management areas ensures the protect and safeguarding all ecosystems in Tanzania. You, you have mentioned uh, 7%. This is uh, a total of 22 full registered wildlife management areas. But we do have other uh, 15 wildlife management areas that are in different stages of establishment. So we hope maybe after all being registered, uh, the number will increase. And we are looking at people who are doing this uh, critical or important uh, work of managing this landscape. It's about 1.2 million people who are coming from 3,334 3, uh, villages across Tanzania. So this is number this number uh, highlight not only uh, how people are you know accepting the concept of community based natural resources but it 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 it, it shows that people can uh, sacrifice their land from other land use uh, to conservation. So that is very important to us. And we have uh, we have seen how uh, these wildlife management areas uh, are important in terms of uh, economic point of view, because in the last five years, we have seen um, a revenue of a total of 12 million USD coming to these wildlife mm -hmm. management areas from tourism uh, business. So, uh, I think for us and for, 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 for the local communities who are owning this and managing these wildlife areas uh, is, it is something uh, that we are, we are so uh, impressed with. But uh, that is uh, for, for, for tourism. But coming to adopting uh, uh, climate change uh, mitigations, uh, CWMC has helped uh, its member six WMAs enter into a uh, contract with uh, Carbon Tanzania uh, for carbon uh, credit business that uh, brings about 4.5 million USD per year. So this not only, uh, you know, covers for operation cost of these WMAs, but also uh, they provide uh, to the community for community development mm. uh, projects and so improving livelihood in communities. And CWMC, uh, with support from Malia Sili, mm. has now uh, endorsed its own, mm. uh, its five years strategic plan of which uh, we are focusing of uh, taking a number from three which are self-funded WMAs. Uh, we are focusing on to 15 areas to be self-funded by the year 2028. So, uh, and this will be manageable due to different areas that CWMC is working on. So the first area is uh, policy reforms. We are working with different parts and the government to make sure that uh, policies that are governing these WMAs are conducive and they provide a very friendly uh, platform for investment, a very friendly platform for community to have uh, rights to manage their resources and benefiting from them. And the uh, part that we are working uh, through this strategic plan is uh, <clears throat> improving governance and strengthening uh, operations of these 
uh, wildlife management areas by, by building capacity of leaders and managers of these wildlife management areas. Before the year 2023, we only had five WMAs with professional managers and accountants who are running and operationalizing the uh, WMA offices. But now we have uh, a number of 12 WMAs with recruited and you know uh, professional accountants. So this means uh, WMAs now are business. WMAs now are, you know, the, the institutions that can run themselves by themselves in terms of uh, managerial and, you know, leadership without even, uh, you know, directly depending on donors, depending on, you know, landscape partners or depending on whoever. But now they're depending on themselves in terms of um, managing the, these uh, wildlife. And but the most important thing is we have uh, a total of 999 ranges across these uh, wildlife management areas. This Thank you is, so much. Um, are not okay. only dangerous ones, they are champions so of conservation. I'm so terribly sorry to interrupt you, Kamuna. Uh, we, we love the work that you're doing. And once again, CWMAC is proving that when people have rights to their land and to their resources, uh, we can see tremendous conservation, climate and livelihood benefits. Um, I'm so sorry to cut you short because of time. But if you're interested in learning more about CWMAC's work, um, please, please visit their website, write directly to them um, and ask questions in the chat. And I'm sure Kamuna and his team will let you know about more about what they do. Um, we are now going to head southwest of the continent to Angola. And today we're joined by Antonio, who is the executive director of Acadia one of the few locally led NGOs in Angola spearheading community conservation efforts. Um, for the past 20 years, Acadia has been working to succeed against all odds, and it's really impressive what they've been able to achieve. Antonio, how, how are cooperatives that Acadia helps people establish, how are they helping these people to access their rights to natural resources? Welcome, Antonio. Uh, yes, Antonio is here. We are struggling to with internet and uh, power. But quickly, if you hearing me, uh, Agadia came into after the war in two thousand. In two thousand, uh, the refugee when they came, they started to chopping the trees and uh, the hunting. And there is why Agadia came with methodology of conservation and agriculture to help the community, especially in Ilwenga Luyana National Park, is where during the war time where was the base military. Uh, the issues was the hunting all 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 wildlife like elephant. Today, uh, I can see that in four years, uh, 11 villages increased crop yield by 87%, improving nutrition and increased direct income to their family. And also, Akkad achieved to work with 22,500 people, practice see uh, conservation agriculture farming as uh, now method you can stay 10 years or 15 years in the same place without chopping the tree or going to hunting and also uh 10 million hectare of 80 percent of angola cultivated by the by ca community where Acadia is working with the community Today, 
uh, in these four years, we we have resisted twenty cooperative uh, conservation cooperative fishery and uh, forest, and also increasing the number of catching fish from three kilogram to twelve kilogram, and which community mobilization and the sensitization in the Lenga Luyana National Park. Yeah, the number of elephants, uh, before we had like a two or 3,000, but today we are having 6,000 elephants in the park. And all community are busy to do conservation agriculture, the need going to chopping trees, and the hunting, hunting have uh, reduced over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Antonio. And um, as we said, you have been succeeding against all odds, including internet, power, infrastructure issues. And I think what really stands out for me about your work is how conservation can really help communities rebuild themselves um, can really help them have access to resources mm -hmm. and ways to to gain benefits yeah. as well. Um, let's go some next. Yeah, so uh, we would like we have one more speaker for the day, um, and and she is a phenomenal speaker. You want to stick around for this? We know we only have three more minutes, so we're going to ask you um, if you would just have two more minutes after the after the the, the bottom of the hour um, to give. More angels visa to 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 speak a little bit more about her work and for us to just um, wrap everything up. So I have already given given it away. We are we are going to be speaking to more angel to Dr. More angels visa in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, if you have not heard her TED talk by now, please go and 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 search for her and find it. It is a very very important TED talk about how community conservation can save wildlife, which is very much of, of, of the work that is being done here and very much centered around the work that she and her team have been doing. So more angels, gonna jump straight into it. You are, you as WCA are a young organization and you started with a focus on reducing human wildlife conflict and to measure your impact there. And you are seeing this, this impact, this reduction in human lion conflict. More than half of these incidents are actually, be, are actually reduced. So my question is, what do communities say about this change? And how do you plan to extend this knowledge and success in minimizing con conflict with other species? Uh, we know you're the lion person, but we know that there, there are other things afoot, so we wanna hear about them. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rason and Wanjiku for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, one of the motivations for, for uh, founding our organization was because of the increase in, in human wildlife conflict, which is one of the major threats that is facing wildlife today in Zimbabwe. So between uh, 2016 and uh, 2021, uh, the conflict has risen by more than 300%. So, so it's one of the reasons why uh, WCA was formed to address this challenge. Uh, which is also a double-edged sword because it affects both people and wildlife uh, negatively. So no one wins uh, in, when conflict happens. And uh, for us, the impact that we are seeing on the ground is what is motivating us and what is inspiring us to, to keep going uh, every day and against all odds uh, and against all the other challenges that we continue to face. And just hearing that from, from the communities on the ground on how our work has impacted their lives is something that is uh, so special for us. So we we, we started um, working in one of the districts called Nyami Nyami District in Zimbabwe around uh, 2021. And it was barely a year after a young man was killed uh, he was attacked and killed by two lions 
um, in, in Yami Yami, he, he was on a motorbike and, and traveling from uh, his home in the community to a safari um, area nearby, and he was attacked and killed. Uh, and so us coming into the community and trying to, to help uh, deal with the lion conflict at that point was something that the community did not uh, welcome because they were very angry um, about the lions. They had negative attitudes uh, because uh, understandably they were losing their lives, their livelihoods to, to lions um, and other wildlife species. So uh, initially they did not want to hear anything about lions. They they did not want to hear anything about conservation because for them, they felt that the, the cost that they were getting from these wildlife species uh, outweighed the benefits that they were getting from, uh, from the wildlife resources. So they did not want to hear anything about that. Um, and they also did not want to hear anything about any of the mitigation measures that we were trying to discuss with them and to, to try with them, like the, the predator-proof mobile bombers. So uh, they are, perception was that they would attract the lions to, to the livestock. So, so the attitudes were very negative. There, there was little cooperation uh, from the community when we started, but uh, because of the, uh, the consultation that we continue to do over the years. Uh, and in the beginning, we just worked with a few uh, community members that were willing to be guinea pigs. Uh, so we, we managed to distribute some of the mobile bombers to these communities. Uh, and within a year, when the other community members started to see the impact of these mobile bombers on protecting livestock, uh, then we started to get more and more community members coming to our office to say they also need to be on the list, on the waiting list for these uh, mobile bombers. Um, and some of them even came to, to say, okay, we, we can contribute something towards the cost because uh, these mobile bombers are a bit expensive. Uh, they are they average about four hundred dollars, and some were saying we can give you fifty dollars so that we can also get a bomber. And this was only because they could see uh, the impact that the bombers were having in protecting livestock. And uh, at the moment, um, the the mobile bombers have been hundred percent effective. So none of the household that had bombers lost any livestock over the past three years. Uh, in the morning, we would come and see the, the, the spores of the lions around these mobile bombers, showing that they did come and visit. And then they would attack uh, or, or next door to, 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 to their neighbor where there would uh, be a, maybe a poor crow. So this really showed the communities that uh, these mitigation measures that we were putting in place were very effective. And some of the community members, like there is uh, uh, a, a, an old man called Mr. Mudena, he he had, he received a mobile bomber and he was putting it in in his uh, crop field because they have also a dual purpose. They uh, increase soil fertility because of the manure from the cow dung. So he was also harvesting now like more crops than he did before using this mobile bomber. And uh, he, well, when we, we talked to him like a few months ago, he was saying that uh, he was going to sell one of his beasts to buy another bomber so that he can also uh, rotate it around his field and increase uh, his crop fields, uh, the yields in his crop fields. So for us, like just seeing this change in the attitudes of the communities towards conservation um, and seeing the effort that the communities are putting into uh, putting up these mitigation measures by themselves. So we can we are seeing now that most of the community members are now heading their cattle. They are now uh, crawling their cattle at night. They are also now um, strengthening their crawls. And this has also resulted in the reduction of of the conflict incidences. So all this work has been because the community uh, has been involved and are now driving these conservation efforts and are now participating in, in, in reducing the, the, the conflict between humans and wildlife. And uh, because of the success of this, um, the, this project, we, we, we started off looking just at lions and other large carnivores, but the community asked us to look at elephants as well and other, other, other species that are causing conflict like crocodiles, uh, because they, they realize the, the, the impact and they now want us to also help them with these species that are causing conflict. And so at the, uh, towards the end of last year, we started working on elephant conflict using uh, chili deterrence. And we, we have also expanded our projects within Yami Yami 
to other wards in the district because also the community in those wards asked us to, to expand because they had seen the impact. So when communities see impact, they want to get involved and they, they rally behind the conservation efforts. Thank you. My gosh, more angels. You know your work is working when the community themselves come and say, we need you to do this. We need you to expand. We are giving you money for a bomber. Like the, your, your work is speaking for itself in the community and it really has spoken for itself here. Thank you so very much. And now we have just finished with all of our speakers. We are so, so grateful to everyone. If you would like to put something into the chat, um, those of you who are here, please put something into the chat, whether it's a question, a comment, one word, just to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to present their impact and their work today. And as you do that, we also want to say that, you know, this work, these impacts, they did not happen um, they, they, they happened as collective efforts. Um, they had a lot of help. They had a lot of backing from various partners and they will need your help. Um, we have set up a page, maliasili.org forward slash impact dash festival. Um, we're we're going to put the link in the chat. Please go there and see if you can support these partners because their work is only possible to, to, to then this impact is only possible if their programs are supported and if their work as organizations is supported, if the if their organizations are able to grow, to retain the talent that they all have, to be able to, to, to go out and do the work, you know, whether it's in forests or with now elephants and lions, or whether it is, you know, um, at the seascapes in these various places, working on governance, working on rights, all of this work needs all of us, it does. Yeah. So thank you so much for staying on for, for, for the few extra minutes. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for all who have made this event possible as well. We are really, really grateful for all your support. Um, if you can unmute panelists and give everybody a, a, a very large hand clap, we're so grateful. And thank you for attending the first Impact Festival. There will be many. Make sure you join thank the next. You. Song, we have a song. <laughs> Do not miss that. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you so everyone. Much. Thank you, my